want to welcome you to another Pod for Israel, and I have with us Dr. Seth Postel, and we're going to be diving into kind of a sneak peek of one of your upcoming Zoom courses. You're going to be discussing the Torah, its message, and its application to our lives. And so there's some really profound things that really changed your life, your view on the scripture. Why don't you dive in and explain kind of what God did through your life and what you're going to teach? Yeah, actually, I'm really excited about this course. I think it's probably one of my favorite courses to teach. Um, it's been for me a journey that's lasted about 23 years, um, and it's been a life-changing journey, and it continues to impact my reading of the entire Bible. So in 2000, the year 2000, I was asked to prepare a survey of the Torah course for uh, an Israeli discipleship program. Mm. And, you know, I had gone to Bible college, and so I'd already studied the, you know, the five books of Moses or whatnot. And I started to do the research. I started to read all these different commentaries. I, I, a friend of mine who's a professor recommended all the, the best commentaries on Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and so on. And I'm reading these commentaries, and I started to feel a sense of being overwhelmed. Number one, it seemed like there was no connection between commentary to commentary. So in terms of, you know, what is the relationship between Genesis and Exodus? Or what is the relationship between Genesis and Leviticus? That's number one, is I couldn't kind of find any um, threads that united it. Number two, um, as a Jewish follower of Jesus, I believe that the New Testament is true. Like, I don't question the authority of the New Testament. I don't question. And so right. I remember reading John chapter 5, verses 45 and 46. Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you'd believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? And so here we have Jesus, who's the greatest authority on Scripture, saying that to believe Moses is to believe Jesus because right. Moses wrote about him. And then I'm looking at the most, the best commentaries on the five books of Moses, and there's almost zero mention of anything messianic in wow. the Torah. Yeah, and you know, this whole notion of cognitive dissonance. So I believed in my heart that Jesus' words were true, but don't ask me to defend it with my head. Like I had no ability really other than maybe to read the Torah um, typologically, which is, you know, for Jewish people, the typological reading many times looks very much like a circus. It looks like like a carnival, like you're, you're, you're reading your views back onto the Old Testament. Mm. So in 2000, I, was, I, I, I met up with a, a professor from, from a Bible college in the United States, and I said, hey, can you just recommend a, a, a commentary on the Torah? I just, I need some help. I'm trying to prepare a course. And he looked at me without hesitation. And he said, John Salhammer, the Pentateuch is narrative. Mm -hmm. So, and then he said to me, and by the way, when you go back to do your master's and your doctorate, you're going to do it with him. Now, the crazy thing was, is I had already had my bachelor's and I had no intention. It wasn't even on my radar to do a master's or a doctorate. It just wasn't even uh, there. Yeah. And, and so I ordered the book and it just so happened that the book arrived right before um, I had to do my army reserve duty here in Israel. So I remember bringing this book up with me. Uh, I lived in Eilat. And uh, it was a long travel up, and I remember starting to read the book, and then I get to the army, and when I'm not out guarding or doing whatever I needed to do, I started reading this book, and I will never forget, um, I, f I felt like I was going to fall out of my chair, because mm -hmm. the name of the book, the Pentateuch as narrative, is quite profound. And basically, the argument that Selhammer puts forth is that though we typically read the Torah as the law book. Right, the book of the law. The book right. of the law. Actually, the laws are part of a story. Right. So if we're going to be faithful to the genre of the Torah, we need to watch it like a movie. Cecil, Cecil B. de Moses, right. from start to finish. We need to read it like a book. We need to read it like a narrative, interpret everything in the context of that narrative. And so as I read... Um, it was amazing. It was like, 
for the first time in my life, I actually became intellectually convinced that the Torah is a book of prophecy, that it is that it is very much a book that's oriented towards the future of Israel. It's a book that already anticipates Israel's failure under the Sinai covenant. It provides all the fodder, it provides all the fuel for all the eschatology of the prophets. When the prophets started talking about a new heart, a circumcised heart, when the prophets talk about the new covenant, when Ezekiel talks about you know the spirit of God in our hearts and, and a heart of flesh, right? Where were they getting this from? They were getting it from Moses. When the prophets start talking about the hope of this coming redeemer, a king, a future, a future redeemer, a suffering servant, right? where are they getting this from? They're getting it from Moses. And so that book became, began a journey. Interestingly enough, I ended up, uh, I ended up going back to the States and studying uh, with John Salehammer, I did my master's degree with him and PhD, and then came back to, to, to the One for Israel Bible College to, to serve and to teach here. Uh, but that book really changed my life. And I'd be happy to share with you a couple of like really yeah, golden us, nuggets. Give us some nuggets that you, you got from it. Yeah. So one of the things that he made me aware of, it's really interesting, is that he kind of, he portrays that if you, if you look at the storyline of the Torah, interspersed throughout the Torah, you actually have these monologues. Right. So in Genesis 3, 5, uh, 14 through 19, you have this monologue of God where he curses the serpent, the ground, punishes man and woman, right? Well, that monologue happens to be a, a poem in, in biblical Hebrew. Hmm. Then you've got other monologues or poems that are interspersed throughout the Torah. So for instance, Jacob's blessing of, uh, of the tribes of Israel at the end of the patriarchal narratives, Genesis 49. Uh, Balaam cursing, trying to curse the people of Israel in Numbers 23 and 24. These are poems. At the end of the Torah, Deuteronomy 32 and 33, you've got uh, the, the Song of Moses, it's a poem. And then you've got the blessing of Moses. It's a poem. And he basically showed that if you, you know, if you're watching a musical, at very key moments within the storyline of the musical, you've got these musicals, it's a story. But all of a sudden, somebody st stands up. <laughs> I've got rhythm, right? Who can ask I've for I've got to <laughs> sing. Yeah, of course. Exactly. Yeah. But what he showed is that these songs, these poems, are not act they're not random at all. They're actually key to what you would call them the, the whole structure of the storyline. Right. And that each of the major poems in the storyline are talking about the last days. So, yeah. so, so let me give you an example. Genesis 49, verse 1. Genesis 49, verse 1, and, and catch the theme here. One of the major themes of the Torah is blessing. Right. Blessing is, you know, all over the Torah. Well, in Genesis 49, Jacob is blessing the tribes of Israel. Right. It's like his final will and testament. Yeah. Let me read to you verse, the first verse. Then Jacob summoned his sons and said, assemble, assemble yourselves that I may tell you what will befall you in, now the New American Standard says in the days to come, but actually mm. the Hebrew says in the last days. Mm. So let me tell you what will happen to you in the last days. Now, this just happens to be a poem of blessing that appears at the very end of the patriarchal narratives. In other words, we're dealing with a major text break. If you're thinking in terms of scenes or acts, yeah. right? This is a major transition. And so this passage is highlighted. Right. Numbers 24, we're coming to the end of the wilderness journeys of Israel, the end of the wilderness journeys, and once again, the theme of blessing. Again, the theme of blessing. Listen to what Balaam says here. And now, this is Numbers 24, 14. And now, behold, I'm going to my people. Come and I will advise you what this people will do to your people. Once again, the New American Standard says, in the days to come. Mm. But the Hebrew says, in the last days. So you think, wait a minute, every time you've got these central poems about blessing, 
The focus is on what God's going to do in the last days. Mm. Let me give you the last example. Very well, people know all about Deuteronomy 32 and 33. De Deuteronomy 30, 32 is a prophetic song of how Israel would forsake the Lord. Yeah. You know, it's a future song. You're going to get to the land. You're going to forsake him. But ultimately, God will atone for your land and your people, right? That's the song of Moses. Well, the next poem is the blessing of Moses, where like Jacob, at the end of his life, just before he's buried and mourned, right, he's blessing the tribes of Israel. Now, again, it's very similar to the blessing of Jacob, but here's what's also very remarkable. You have just before these poems, you have the introduction to these poems. You want to understand these poems? Here's what Moses says. Deuteronomy 31, verses 28 and 29. Assemble to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their hearing and call the heavens and the earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death you will act corruptly and turn from the way which I have commanded you. And evil will befall you in, New American Standard says, the latter days. But the Hebrew says, in the last days. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of head count, the word last days doesn't appear a lot in the Torah. It appears actually one other time in the beginning of Deuteronomy. But it's not, uh, it's not uh, quantity, but quality. And I want you to think about this. If, if blessing is such a crucial theme in the Torah, right? right? But typically God gives commandments, like to Adam and Eve, right. they fail, and what results? Curses. Mm -hmm. God gives commandments to Israel, right. right? But Deuteronomy 28 is filled with the curses of disobedience, which Moses says is, they're going to happen. You will go to exile. The curses will fall upon you. Right. So the question then becomes when we read this incredible story of the Torah, then how if, if we constantly disobey, every time God gives us commandments, we're going to, we're going to, we never miss, and Golda Meir used to say, they never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. So we're going to yeah. miss that opportunity. So if God so much wants to bless us, how can we be blessed? Well, the Torah really emphasis, emphasizes in its structure the importance of eschatology. In other words, the key to the blessings God promises to Abraham, through Abraham, to Israel, and to the nations, the key is the last days. Mm. Eschatology. Right. This realization blew me away and suddenly it's like it's like when you go to a movie and you know you have these 3d movies and and you don't know that the 3d without the glasses right right you don't know it and then suddenly you put those glasses on and it's like whoa mm -hmm. I, I I did not notice this about the story well let me just simply say one of the most important keys to reading the Torah is to realize how important the last days are Right. And it's theology. And when you say that, you're talking about like the, the focus on setting your eyes on the hope of the last days, not necessarily the nuances of eschatology like we think of today, but, but really the view of the last days, the view of the kingdom coming, right? So David Kimchi, who was a very famous medieval rabbi, he said something interesting. He said every time that phrase, uh, in the last days, appear in, appears in the Hebrew Bibles, in the Hebrew Bible, those are the days of the Messiah. Mm. And what's really interesting is that, for instance, Genesis 49 mentions this coming of a king from the tribe of, uh, from the tribe of Judah. Right. Right. In what context? The last days. Balaam, in trying to curse Israel, starts talking about the last days. Yeah. Numbers 24, 14. Well, a few verses later, verse 17, I see him, but not now. I behold him, mm. but not close. Right. Right. A star will come forth from Jacob, right? Mm. He's talking about a future king, the Messiah. So when we talk about the last days, I would argue that it, 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 it deals with the coming of the Messiah. Now, actually as well, and again, in the course, we're going to talk more about it, within the structure of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is kind of like the final speech of Moses, 
the final speech of Moses and Deuteronomy 4 and Deuteronomy 30, they, they actually frame the, the structure of Deuteronomy and what's remarkable. In fact, let me just read it just because you wouldn't believe me if, if I didn't read it for you. So Deuteronomy, 20, uh, Deuteronomy 4, I'll start in verse, um, verse 25. Okay. When you become the father of children and children's children and have remained long in the land and act corruptly, that's a prophetic orientation. And make an idol in the form of anything and do that which is evil in the sight of the Lord your God so as to provoke him to anger. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today. By the way, that's already anticipating the song of Moses, which begins, listen, O heavens, hear, O earth. Hmm. Okay, so this is part of the structure. So I'll call heaven and earth to witness against you. What? That you will surely perish quickly from the land where you are going over the Jordan to possess it. You shall not live long on it, but will be utterly destroyed. The Lord will what? Scatter you among all the peoples. Now this is, this. Mm. even this prophecy goes beyond, beyond the exile to Babylon. Right. They didn't, they weren't scattered over the ends of the earth. They were scattered to Babylon. This perspective here, he will scatter, scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in numbers among the nations where the Lord drives you. There you will serve gods, the work of man's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there, you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. When you are in distress and all these things have come upon you, in the last days, you will return to the Lord your God and listen to his voice. Mm -hmm. Once again, this sounds, if I were to read this and I didn't know it was in Deuteronomy, I would think I'm reading in Ezekiel. Right. I would think I was reading in Jeremiah or in Isaiah. Why? Because the, prof the prophet's eschatology was rooted in the hope that even though Israel most assuredly will fail and break the Sinai covenant, there's still hope in the last days. So that's Deuteronomy 30, okay? Or sorry, Deuteronomy chapter four. Deuteronomy 30 repeats almost verbatim this same language. So it shall be, the chapter 30, verse one. So it shall be when all these things have come upon you, the blessing, the curse, which I've set before you, and you call them to mind in the nations where the Lord your God has banished you. And you return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and soul, according to all that I command you today, to you and to your sons. Then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. I'm gonna skip down to verse uh, five. Then the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed and you shall possess it. And he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Moreover, listen to verse six. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart mm. and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. When you kind of see the way that Deuteronomy 4 and Deuteronomy 30 are repeating the same themes and Deuteronomy 4 sets this future restoration of Israel and gathering from the nations in the last days. And then in the last days, what is God gonna do? Deuteronomy 30 verse six, he's gonna circumcise the hearts of the people. Right, which that's, that's clearly a, a new covenant right there. It's, that, a, it's not the covenant of flesh, but of, of the spirit. So this is what's remarkable is that Moses is the first preacher of the new covenant. Hmm. Many times we think that Jeremiah kind of right. says, okay, you know, God says through Jeremiah, listen, it didn't work out. We tried, it I didn't work out. I got a new idea. Out. Have <laughs> I got a good deal for you, right? Nothing like that at all. Right. In other words, the new covenant is, is, is a covenant that Moses already said needed to take place. He anticipated right. that Israel would break the Sinai Covenant. And so this perspective of eschatology, these glasses of the last days, when I come to reading the Torah, changes the way I read every aspect of it, including mm. the laws. Well, and you know, even just like him giving this prophecy, knowing that the law was weak to do the job that it needed to do. You know, that's a whole nother bag of chips right there. But it's like, he he knew that it was it, there needed to be something greater 
there was a greater covenant that would be once and for all. Because he ends it right there. He ends it with the, on the happy note of restoration. The Torah ends in blessing. Deuteronomy 33, yeah. praise God. Yeah. It ends in blessing. It's interesting, once again, you're hitting on themes that I think are so closely rooted in the text. You know, if you look at the story of Israel in Mount, you know, in their, on their journey to Mount Sinai, on their journey away from Mount Sinai, at Mount Sinai, the whole story is riddled with complaining. Right. Before and after Mount Sinai, mm -hmm. it's riddled with, with failure, but it's also infused with God's grace. So one of the darkest moments in the Torah story is the golden calf. Right. Right? So at the golden calf, let me just read to you something quite remarkable. It says this, Exodus 34, verses 5 and following. The Lord descended in the, descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed in front of him, Moses, and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, mm. slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. One of the most profound, greatest, clearest revelations of the graciousness and the long suffering and the love and the faithfulness of God yeah. is in the midst of the golden calf hmm. where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Wow. And so I think as we, we do this course, I think people are gonna be really surprised. They're gonna be shocked that yeah. the Torah is a, it's, it's, it's a story of grace. Mm. It's a story of hope. It's a story of faith. It's a story of eschatology. And it's a story of the Messiah. Well, and I think, you know, as you and I have discussed this over the years, I, I've just, it's really enriched my reading of the scriptures, even as I teach my children, you know, as a storyteller, as a filmmaker, it's, for me, I, I just, it all clicks together because when you start to see the narrative, and I think you don't have to be a filmmaker or a writer or whatever, it, you know, God will open up your eyes when you start to see with this new perspective. I, really, I think this is probably one of the most profound courses that we could we, you could take because I know the impact it's had on my reading of the Old Testament, of, of my reading of the prophets. It's just really the whole Pentateuch, the whole, the whole scripture as one, as one narrative together. And when we even talk about apologetics here in Israel, one of the, I, I guess one of the big issues that we have with many of our Jewish brothers coming to faith is that the rabbis have clearly said it's a law book. In fact, one one you know great rabbi had said, well, it, it, actually the Torah should have started with what is it like? It was the first Exodus command, twelve. Exodus first, twelve. That's right. Right. So, which is crazy, bonkers to think. <laughs> how could you say it should have started this way, God? But that's their understanding. They see it strictly as a law book. They don't see the narrative. So it's important to tell this narrative. It's important for us to see the narrative, but also to share this narrative with the world. So you know what's really interesting, and you're hitting on a good point. So if I try to read the Torah as a law book, in other words, right. it's just a law book with some narratives, what ends up happening is that suddenly the laws, they can become very confusing apart from the narrative. Right. And it almost, it, for the rabbis, it required oral tradition. Mm. It required more. Yeah. And so if you look at, if you look at the, the Torah, you know, as a book and next to it, the Talmud, the mission and the Talmud, and you realize huh, that it's like it, th this one book produces this huge library of all these oral traditions trying to explain the Torah Right. It's almost like you realize that you're trying to use a hammer to scratch your back. <laughs> In other words, apparently, if this book requires this book to explain it, then, mm -hmm. then maybe there's something wrong. If, maybe the way you're reading is wrong. But if you look, it's really interesting. If you look at the size of the New Testament, mm -hmm. like if you, if you looked at all the books of the New Testament, what, 27 books, right? Yeah. It's thin. <laughs> yeah. It's thin. And so if you look at the... If you read the Torah as a narrative, yeah. it leads you to the New Testament. Yeah. 
it doesn't lead you to more oral law and oral traditions and right. you know and trying to count and figure out all these laws what it ends up doing is it leads you to the feet of Jesus right and to a circumcised heart and of course we see you know our rabbi yeshua he taught through story he thought he he actually illustrated the gospel through narrative form and of course that shows the whole thing his strategy always is that we share these stories. So, man, you know, I highly encourage our listeners, you guys check out this course. I mean, go deep because I just know just even the conversations I've had with you, Seth, have been really, you know, mind-blowing, eye-opening. It's really changed my whole view and given me a whole fresh new perspective. And again, this is a new way to even share the gospel, share the story of salvation when you see it through the whole route, all the way from Genesis to Revelation, and so. Uh, thank you, and I actually would encourage people to come, and in fact, one of the things we're gonna be discussing in the course as well is the believer's relationship to the law, because you know that's a very common question, right? and we're not gonna to touch it today. I mean, that's a big issue. That's another podcast. It's <laughs> another podcast, but it's a course as well. In other right. words, uh, so many emails and text messages that I've received over the years are, you know, I don't know what to do. Like, right. how do I, how do I, how do I, I believe that the Torah is scripture, but what do I do with the laws and how do they apply to my life? And so yeah. I think one of maybe the, maybe the, the big um, payload in this course is to shed light on how we can read these laws right. as scripture right. and apply them to our lives today. That's good. Well, Father in heaven, we just thank you for this story of salvation that you have woven so intricately, Lord, through thousands upon thousands of years, through many, many authors, Lord, you have woven your story of love for us, and that's what it is. The gospel is this love letter of your greatness and of your calling us to yourself. I just ask that you would draw us to yourself, um, that our listeners would draw close to you, that you would open their eyes to this new way of reading the scriptures, that you would make the Pentateuch, uh, the Torah, come alive to them in a way that they've never seen before, that they would see Yeshua's love in the midst of all of that and, uh, and your narrative of grace and salvation. We just pray this in Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. If this touched your heart, will you help pay it forward so that others can hear the same message of life? Partner with our team to bring the gospel to Israel and the nations. 